Good morning. Um, take a look on page um, 77. Top of the page there. Even when I carry out scientific work, by scientific work he means uh, work, for example, done in a, a lab or in a university setting, an activity which I can seldom conduct in direct association with other people, I perform a social because it is a human act. It is not only the material of my activity, like the language itself which the thinker uses, which is given to me as a social product. Uh, the language I use is a language produced by the society to, into, to which I have become enculturated. My own existence is a social activity. Um, what Marx is saying is there uh, is, is that the individual, again, like as in Hegel, the individual can become an individual only in a society. And it's, which means my own existence is itself a social activity. It's not possible to opt out. Um, even uh, the expatriate, expat, someone who um, leaves the United States to live abroad uh, is still an ex from a particular country with, and he brings the cultural baggage um, that is his. Um, okay, for this reason, uh, what I myself produce, um, I produce for society. Um, <clears throat> and with the consciousness of acting as a social being. Uh, even someone who is on welfare is producing for society. Um, and indeed, um, Marx will insist, uh, interestingly enough, as we'll see much later, uh, that even the criminal uh, is a social producer, but we will get into that later. Okay. Um, the. Um, Okay, let's, let's uh, flip over to, <clears throat> this is what we want to get into today. Um, the forms of property and the modes of production. Okay. Um, <clears throat> he, he starts off with Robinson Crusoe. And Robinson Crusoe was stranded on this island and he kept books on it, how much time it took he prioritized what needed to be done, and he made he accounted he, he noted the amount of time it took to produce whatever it had to be whatever he did right okay, so uh, it consists of nothing but different modes of human labor okay necessity itself compels him Robinson Caruso um, to apportion his time accurately between his different kinds of work. Um, okay, moving right down. His stock book contains a list of useful objects that he possesses, of the operations necessary for their production, of those objects have, what those objects have, on average, cost him. Okay, so uh, what we're talking is uh, labor time. Mm -hmm. Um, on average, cost him. All the relationship between Robinson and the objects that form his, this wealth of his own creation are here so simple and clear as to be intelligible without any explanation. And yet these relations contain all that is essential to the determination of value, okay? Okay. And what is value? Value is the amount of labor time um, necessary to produce a commodity. Okay. 
Um, this, this was a real problem in the 19th century, and, and why? Um, it was the value of, okay, the, the, the value of a commodity uh, can be relatively, can be more simply determined. But the value of a service is somewhat more difficult. Um, <clears throat> for example, a haircut. In, there's a place in Lacey where I have gone, and the haircut was eight dollars. Um, <clears throat> And uh, it was customary to leave a two-dollar tip <laughs> to the uh, barberess, um, lady barber, uh, who cut your hair. And um, <clears throat> she was a nice Korean lady. And the, um, however, if, uh, if you go to Giorgio's in Beverly Hills, you're not going to pay eight dollars for, because Giorgio is not simply a, someone who cuts hair, he's a hair stylist. And his fee may be $800 rather than eight. <laughs> and you may even have to leave a tip. <clears throat> okay, so the, determining the, the, the value of services is, uh, was, a, was a problem. Um, a, a Fichte tackled it. Um, the amount of um, how long you can live off what you produce. That was a way of determining the value of a service. Um, but, I mean, consider, well, I mean, when I was born, uh, my father took out a policy. It was called a burial policy. Um, and um, dutifully paid in every year uh, into this policy. It, 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 it was for $1,000. Well, that was some years back <laughs> when I was born. <clears throat> and today, I don't think you could get, you can't even get cremated for $1,000. Um, and the, uh, uh, the uh, a burial service, it, well, what is it? 8,000. What? About 8,000. <laughs> I mean, well, it depends on depending on what kind of casket you have, what kind of service you have at the church, uh, how much you pay the singer, the choir director, and uh, uh, the organist. It it could run anywhere between twenty and thirty thousand dollars. If it's really serious. Yeah, it's it's. So, what is the value of a service? It's it, you you could say well, it's what they are able to get away with charging. <laughs> and, um, hmm. okay, anyway, the, um, uh, he, over on the next page, page 106, um, so the amount of labor time necessary to produce a, a commodity, but of course that doesn't take care of something like a service. Or uh, think of the value of um, a Van Gogh, right? Uh, GH, I think, right? Okay, the value of a, a Van Gogh painting. Well, he may have sold one for $50, or maybe, <laughs> maybe even less. Now you, you, you how, you'd say, well, the value of is whatever someone is willing to pay on Sotheby's, where it comes up for, on auction. And uh, anyway, it's, you, undoubtedly, you would not be able to buy a Van Gogh for $50, maybe even, uh, yeah, maybe even not even a good forgery. <laughs> um, it's probably closer to 50 million, at least. <clears throat> Okay, anyway, so uh, where do they, the, um, here are the particular, for, middle of um, uh, page 106. Here are the particular and natural form of labor, and not as in society based on production of commodities in general abstract form, is the immediate 
social form of labor. Um, and as Marx goes on to say, compulsory labor is just as much measured by time as commodity producing labor. Compulsory labor. Well, the difference between is the, um, uh, is the slave, uh, is the serf a slave? No, not quite. I mean, he belongs to the land, um, but is the serf a slave? No, not quite. Uh, the, uh, even the, the lord of the estate, as, as we saw, is also, the, he inherits the land? No, the land inherits him, according to Marx. And uh, in other words, he's no longer an individual any more than the serf is. Um, the, uh, um, well, what is it, the, the Earl of Sussex. The Earl of Sussex, you don't even know his name. He's just the Earl of Sussex. He belongs to the land as much as the serf did. Okay, so, however, don't imagine the, the laborer, right? Um, the laborer is, uh, is not a slave, nor is he a serf, right? Remember, he's a free laborer, right? And by free, it means he's he's free to sell his labor to the the uh, to the capitalist. Okay, let's go a little further. Um, uh, okay, on page uh, one two two. Well, no, we did that already. <clears throat> um, the feudal land ownership, the ownership of the earth appears as an alien power ruling over men. The serf is the product of the land, right? He goes, he goes along with the land. Um, okay, uh, moving right along. Um, the origins and uh, over on page 127. <clears throat> the origins and development of capitalism. Okay, capitalism is... When does capitalism begin? When, 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 when? Okay, capitalism begins when labor becomes a commodity. In other words, when it is something bought and sold on in the market, okay? Uh, for example, uh, well, how much does labor cost? Um, in, the, in, in the time of the in first century Palestine, it was a denarius. De, de, denarius? A denarius. Um, uh, in the days of my grandfather, it was uh, a dollar a day. When I joined the workforce, it wasn't a dollar a day, it was about a dollar and a quarter an hour. <laughs> and okay, so um, yeah, and uh, t well, today you have you have a minimum wage. Of course, the problem with with setting a minimum wage nationally is that uh, obviously there are some cities in which you live which costs more to live than in other cities. I mean, for example, uh, living in Lacey is less expensive than living in Seattle. Um, and uh, living in San Francisco is, you can't afford to live there. <laughs> I mean, you, which of course causes all kinds of problems in places like San Francisco. Um, there are certain people who are essential to the running of any metropolitan area, for example, police, fire, uh, nurses, and if, if they are unable to live even close to where they work, um, the city's going to have a problem. I mean, you need, you need police and firemen no matter what. <clears throat> and uh, so, uh, the, the, the city has to uh, institute, when they build a new building, right, in San Francisco, there's a um, provision in the law which uh, says you have to set aside a certain number of units for 
people like policemen, firemen, nurses, and uh, teachers, etc. Right. So um, <clears throat> um, that's the way they sort of get around that problem. Um, okay, and remember what capitalism is? Includes capitalism, well no, we'll see that a little bit in more detail shortly, so let's uh, hold off on that. Okay, meanwhile, um, over on page 127, uh, par paragraph three uh, down. Meantime, the markets kept ever growing. Hmm. Um, The demand ever rising, even manufacture no longer suffice. Thereupon, steam and machinery revolutionized industrial produ production. Well, remember the industrial revolution. Uh, James Watt uh, <clears throat> discovered the steam engine in 1679, I wrote it down. No, 1769, excuse me. Uh, I think that's, well, I, that's when it was, he, he patented it, that, uh, the date in which you get. So the place of manufacture was taken by the giant modern industry. The place of the industrial middle class by industrial millionaires capitalists, the leaders of whole industrial armies, the modern bourgeois. Um, uh, the bourgeois in, in, in Hegel's world, the bourgeoisie, were shopkeepers, farmers, uh, uh, members of different guilds, etc. right? Um, the bourgeoisie for um, uh, Marx has a slightly, uh, has a considerably different meaning, right? <clears throat> um, the modern bourgeoisie is, um, well, it's basically the capitalist, right? Uh, and, okay, let's move on. <clears throat> um, page one, uh, page one, three, two, okay. Uh, down at the, toward the, uh, uh, the bottom of that par uh, second paragraph there. It is otherwise with capital. Um, <clears throat> the historical conditions of its existence, the historical conditions of its existence, are by no means given with the mere circulation of money and commodities. Uh, we know what money is. Money is a process. It's also um, uh, the, um, um, <clears throat> it's, system, uh, it's a system of relations. Right? <clears throat> so it arises only when the owner of the means of production, okay, capitalism owns the means of production, <clears throat> okay, unlike the um, member of a guild in the Middle Ages who owned the means of production, I mean, he owned his tools, for example. Um, <clears throat> the wage laborer in a factory does not own the machines that he uses. Those are owned by the, the means of production are owned by the capitalist. Um, uh, and the means of subsistence, Uh, the means of subsistence, well, you, what, what do you need to subsist as a human being? You need food, clothing, and food, clothing, so food, shelter. You need food, clothing, and shelter, the means of subsistence. And those are also owned by the capital. He doesn't, the, the wage laborer does not own those things. Um, <clears throat> Uh, well, neither did the serf, but the serf <laughs> had them as a kind of a permanent dwelling. Um, the means of subsistence meets in the market with the free laborer selling his labor power. Right? Uh, okay, so the free laborer sells his labor power for a denarius, a dollar a day, or whatever the minimum wage, wage happens to be, <clears throat> uh, in It varies, <clears throat> and uh, because it, it costs more to live in different areas of the uh, country. 
<clears throat> um, the free labor is selling his labor, labor power, okay? <clears throat> um, well, remember, um, you, if, if labor, right, if labor is a form of alienation, then in selling your labor, okay, and, and if labor creates the self, <clears throat> then in selling your labor, you sell yourself. However, the, the wage laborer is not a slave, right? Because he's a free laborer. He's free to sell his labor to whomever, to whichever um, firm, capitalist, he, he, uh, he, he, he wishes. But he's probably going to have to sell it to somebody, right? Because he's going to need to subsist. So the means of production, means of subsistence. Oh, and also, um, we we saw he also owns the raw material. And again, the raw materials are not natural resources. The raw materials are, uh, for example, like ore, have to be need. Uh, labor has to be exerted upon them in order to produce the ore that the uh, capitalist uses to manufacture uh, whatever, okay? <clears throat> um, so, uh, his labor, okay. And this one historical condition comprises a whole stage of history, okay? A whole stage of history, namely, uh, capital. Capital therefore announces from its first appearance a new epoch in the process of social production. Okay? <clears throat> it's an entirely new form of social production distinct from say some, anything that happened in the Middle Ages or in ancient times. Um, in ancient times there was slavery. Uh, it, was, it was essential to the, it was part and parcel of the economic structure of the ancient world. Slavery. You know, it's, it's just the way it was. <clears throat> okay, let's go a little further. Um, mm, over on page 133, he says, the capitalist system presupposes the complete separation of the laborers from all property. Right? Okay. As soon as capitalist production is firmly established, uh, it not only maintains this separation, but pre reproduces it on a continually extending scale. Um, <clears throat> the, um, okay, <clears throat> which means, I mean, the, the, the laborer, right? Um, labor becomes, the free laborer, becomes, um, <clears throat> uh, he separated not only from um, property, right? he's also separated from his fellow laborers. That's going to be a, a, an additional meaning of alienation in Marx. Why? Well, because he's competing for the same lousy jobs as all the other day laborers are competing for. So, uh, and the notion of uh, unions, uh, we're not really certain whether Marx is in favor of unions. Because unions might somehow ameliorate the lousy condition in which laborers are forced to live. So, and that would forestall the revolution. So Marx is, you're not, we're never quite sure whether Marx really is in favor of unions, right? Um, and indeed, uh, the, um, uh, the, the, the laborers are alienated from each other because both are competing for the same um, um, employment. The process, therefore, that clears the way for the capitalist system can be none other than the process which takes away from the laborer the possession of his means of production. In other words, he loses his tool. 
um, a process that transforms, on the one hand, the social means of subsistence, right? He doesn't own the house he lives in or the store he shops at, and of the production of capital, on the other, the immediate producers into wage laborers. Um, uh, as a member of a guild in the Middle Ages, one had a certain social status. Right? As, a labor, uh, as a day laborer, uh, that's not necessarily uh, the case. Um, over on page 134, but on the other hand, these new freedmen, right, the free laborer, um, these new freedmen become sellers of themselves, right? right? And well, I mean, when you produce your resume, what are you trying to do? You're trying to sell yourself to a potential employer, right? Now, only uh, after they have been robbed of all their own means of production, right? In other words, they, they no longer have the tools of their trade, and of all the guarantees of existence afforded by, by the old feudal arrangements. Well, um, there was, there was a, uh, uh, between the serf and the lord, liege lord, there was a relationship. Uh, the serf worked, for, worked the estate for the liege lord, uh, but he, he also received um, uh, what, whatever he required. He was taken care of and protected by the liege lord. So it was, a, uh, it, was a, it was a workable social arrangement. Um, you wouldn't say the serf was a slave uh, by any means. Although we come across the first, uh, down to the bottom of page 134. Um, although we've come across the first beginnings of capitalist production as early as the 14th or 15th century, right? When does capitalism begin? When does capitalism begin? It begins when labor becomes a commodity, right? And uh, uh, maybe as early as the 14th or 15th century, according to, to Marx, sporadically in town, certain towns in the Mediterranean. The capitalist era dates from the 16th century, okay? Uh, <clears throat> uh, whenever it appears, the ab abolition of serfdom right, has, long, has been long effected, and the crowning glory of the Middle Ages, the sovereign, self-governing towns, has long been on the wane. Okay? Well, think um, uh, Venice. Think Florence. Okay? Uh, Venezia, Firenze, uh, these, they were um, self-governing towns, right? And uh, they were important uh, economic centers. Uh, Venice, especially for trade, because it was located on, in the, on the Adriatic, and um, uh, on the Mediterranean, and, and Florence, because it was banking, right? The Medicis. And, uh, <clears throat> Um, okay, moving right along. <clears throat> um, okay, yeah, we gotta do this, I guess. All right, here we go. The social system of capitalism. Okay, <clears throat> um, what does the capitalist own? He owns the means of production, means of subsistence, raw materials. And in a way, he, he, he owns the laborers too, but not as slaves, right? Uh, he, but he's, uh, um, <clears throat> okay, the social relations within which individuals produce, the social relations of production are altered, transformed with the change and development of the material means of production, of the forces of production, right? You're going to get, uh, you're going to get, a so you're going to get social changes with economic changes. In other words, you change the, the, uh, the forces of production in a particular society, you're changing also the society. And uh, the society goes through a revolution. Right? Uh, 
in making such social changes. The relations of production in their totality constitute what is called the social relations society, and moreover, a society at a definite stage of historical development, but a society with a unique and distinctive character. Uh, well, feudalism, right? Um, <clears throat> Um, age of capitalism. Um, <clears throat> okay, moving right along. Capital, here we go. Uh, down to the, on page 147, the second paragraph on the bottom. Capital consists not only of the means of subsistence, um, the instruments of labor, means of production, uh, and raw materials, but also material products. What? In other words, all those cars produced by Ford sitting in the parking lot uh, were produced by Ford. And Ford owns them. And, or, and they're consigned to dealerships. Um, capital consists not only in the means of uh, in raw materials, but also material products. It consists just as much of exchange values. Okay, remember, <clears throat> and what is an exchange value? Well, exchange value is um, uh, <clears throat> the amount of purchasing power. Mm -hmm. um, the the commodities purchasing power. In other words, what uh, commodities purchasing power? <clears throat> okay. Um, all products of which it consists are commodities, right? Um, capital, consequently, is not only a sum of material products, the material products produced by the capitalists, it is a sum of commodities of exchange values of social magnitudes. Okay, look down the bottom paragraph there, this is important. Capital, therefore, presupposes wage labor, right? <clears throat> capital, you need, well, you need the laborers. Um, wage labor presupposes capital, right? You, have to, you haven't got a wage laborer unless you've got a capitalist willing to pay the wage. They condition each other. Each brings the other into existence. So what's the wage laborer? Uh, okay, remember, labor creates value. Or, okay, and how? Uh, it creates, uh, it, it creates capital by uh, exchange value and surplus value. <clears throat> okay. Um, the product is sold for, okay, what's, what's the surplus value? Okay, well that's the, that's what we would call profit. Okay, surplus value. Okay, who gets the surplus value? According to Marx, the one who should get the surplus value is the wage laborer because the wage labor, because labor produces value. <laughs> Not according, uh, <clears throat> wait a minute. Ah, who gets, so the, the wage laborer should get the profit. Well, you'd say, well, both the capitalist and the wage laborer should get the, have, should share in the profit. Profit sharing, that's not fair. Uh, it doesn't work that way. The capitalist gets the, um, he, uh, according to Marx, the capitalist gets the uh, exchange value and the surplus value. And the, um, what the wage laborer gets is his wages, which of course he consumes. And he gets none of the profit, and the profit, the profit goes to the capitalist. Well, you'd say, now wait a minute, Marx, isn't that, that, I mean, he's the one who took out the loans to build the factory, right? And 
he took a risk in taking out those loans to build the factory. So why shouldn't he get the profit from his investment? Marx says, no, labor creates value. And what kind of labor does the capitalist produce? Hmm. Mental labor. Hmm. <laughs> How do you calculate that? Good question. Okay, we'll see you next time, like on maybe Monday. Yeah, Monday. And don't forget your papers on the 15th. Happy 